Hey guys, Bailey Hancock here. My guest today is somebody that we all desperately need um, at one point or another in our careers. Michelle Lando is a certified professional resume writer, so we're gonna ask her all the questions, don't worry, and a personal branding expert. And I think those two things go beautifully hand in hand, so I'm super excited to dig in and ask all the questions that I know you're all dying to know because resumes are one of those great mysteries of the world that even though we've all been doing them the whole time, it feels like one of those things that most of us still don't get totally right. So Michelle, I'm so excited to have you. I have all the questions. <laughs> I am so excited to be here. Ask away. Excellent. Okay. Well, first and foremost, before we get into resume advice, I want to know, I ask everybody, did you want to, did you grow up wanting to be a professional resume writer? I'm going to go ahead and guess no. Nope. Um, <laughs> what did you want to be when you grew up? What did you go to school for? Start us at the beginning. Yeah. Um, I'm actually sixth generation born and raised in San Francisco. So cool. I, yeah, I always was around chaos and fashion and all this stuff. And I always knew that I wanted to do something in fashion. And my grandfather, hmm. I told him when I was six years old that I didn't know what I wanted to do if I wanted to design clothes or something around fashion. And he said, you can do anything that you want as long as you know the business behind it. Because mm -hmm. my family actually was in the sunglass business. And so they had a really great sunglass business in the 80s and they sold it um, when I was really little. So I always knew I wanted to do something around that. And then I went to school and I got a degree in business econ. And then I was a clothing stylist at Nordstrom. And great. I actually, my initial goal, I was going to take over the company. I was going to go all, yep. Oh. I was going to go all the way to the top and be a buyer or whatever it was. And I very quickly, well, very quickly, like three years later, <laughs> found out that retail wasn't right for me. And to be honest, I have a lot of respect for Nordstrom, but I was pretty miserable. I was commuting an hour each way to work. Oh, well, that doesn't and, help like anybody like their job. No, <laughs> not at all. I was commuting an hour each way to work. And I felt like it became more about selling than actually helping people. Uh, so I left that job with no job prospects. I got to the point where I was just like, I'm commuting an hour each way. I'm so burnt out that I don't have enough time to even look for another job. And I really need time to rejuvenate and figure out what I want to do. And, and how so old were you at this point? Because I think that always... I was, um, let's see, I was like 22, 23. So, so I ask because that is like, I kind of had a feeling you were going to say 22, 23, because that seems to be the phase in most people's very early careers where they're like, F this. I'm bored yep. already. What am I doing with my life? And they have these existential crises where it's like, I've, I've gone down this path. It's too late to change. Like it's either that where they think it's too late because they've invested too much time into this particular topic or they're ready to just throw everything out and start over because it's well, still young enough. You're still young enough to do that. Absolutely. And it's really funny that you say that because I got to that point, like I said, where I loved the clothing. I loved styling people, but I just I, you and I actually talked about this before, but I am not someone to push myself on you and sell everything. You know, with my clients, I'm very big on, if you want to work with me, that's awesome. I really think I can help you, but I'm not going to sell you on this. Yeah. Like, that's you have I to be in the, kind of exactly. Sticky. You have to be in the right mindset sticky. that you want to help yourself. Yeah. So I left Nordstrom and I found myself, I felt very pigeonholed where people were sitting there going, oh, well, you worked at Nordstrom. That's great on customer service, but you can't be in an office. You don't know anything about being in an office. And I was sitting there going, how do people change careers later in life when I'm like 22, 23 and having so much difficulties? And so I actually started temping, which is funny because I tell everyone, I think it's a really, really underserved way or underutilized way to get your foot in the door. This has, temping has literally come up no less than four or five times in the interviews I've done so yep. far. And I, I personally never once considered temping. I have one friend that I know, that I knew prior to all of these people telling me they've done it, who did temping for a while and ended up in some cool places, but it never occurred to me to like use that as a way to build my resume. Absolutely. It is the one thing that I tell people all of the time, especially if, people are really unhappy at a job. I always tell them temp, you know, leave your job that you're unhappy with work at a temp agency. What it's also a really good way. And we'll talk about this later, but it's a really good way to kind of camouflage um, gaps in your resume. Ooh, smart. Yeah. 
but so I started temping and then I got into recruiting. And it was at a recruiting company that I saw people really, really struggling with resumes. And I had always kind of helped my friends with resumes just because I've always liked writing. Um, I helped my friends with their resumes. I don't know if I just said with my resume, but I helped my friends with their resumes. And as I started working in recruiting, I saw people really struggling and I looked into it and I realized that you could become a certified professional resume writer, which I had no idea about. Nope, never and, heard of that. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I got certified. I went through the whole training and the certification and the test it, and all that good stuff. Is it stuff. like a kind of just like a school or is it something, I imagine you don't go to like a community college for, where did you... I just through the Professional out. Association of Resume Writers. Oh, sure, and of course. Yeah, of course, course there's because there's a professional association. association. For everything. Yes, absolutely. So I looked it up, and they basically send you a whole stack of information, and it's an online course and all this stuff. And then at the end of it, whenever you're ready to take the test, they basically send you like 10, 15 pages of information. There's a multiple choice test. And then they send you like 15 pages of information, and they say, you have... 48 hours to create a resume and you need to print it out, do everything and certify, mail it and stamp it. And then they have a panel of people basically judge the resume. So this is super fish. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is what I'm doing. And I did that and I got certified in December of 2014. And from there for about a year and a half, I was working my day job at the recruiting company and I was working at night and kind of during the day too on my own business. And it got to the point in June of 2016 that I kind of realized I'm losing business on my company working my other job. So right. I finally was like, you know what? I've built a client base. I have built a name for myself. I'm actually comfortable that I can go out on my own. And so how then, did you build that base? Like how did you get your first customer? I, my first customer was actually someone that was at the recruiting company and needed help with a resume. And I was like, hey, I, I can help you with that. I can do this. And to be honest, I didn't know what to charge. I didn't know anything. And I kind of just threw a number out there and I looked it up and they were like, yeah, absolutely. I'll totally pay for this. And that's kind of where it started. And so I was kind of doing it on the side because, you know, at first it's hard. To, you have well, no idea. Yeah, you have no idea. Especially when you are your product or your service. Exactly. There is so many, there are so many hangups with what to charge and what's the, it's, it's hard to find, like, especially in like the coaching realm or yes. the kind of, I feel like the category that you probably fall under, it's hard to find out information without like pretending to be a potential customer and like going exactly. to resume writers and asking and then using that as a baseline. It's hard to get that information to even absolutely. Know and a lot of the resume companies I find they're companies and they're online um, algorithms that just generate a resume for you. Uh, so it was definitely a learning curve, but you would be shocked at how many people Google resume help or resume writer. I was going to say, did you just like corner the SEO market on that? I did a lot of SEO, but also Yelp has been a huge, huge oh. factor. And it's something that, again, I think is really underutilized, especially for small business owners. But what happens is people search on Google for a term or resume writer or career coach or whatever they search for. But because Yelp is so highly recognized, Yelp comes up. So they're not necessarily going specifically to Yelp to search for it. But yeah. when they search online, Yelp is coming up and then they That's can see reviews. I've yeah. never, I actually don't know. And maybe this is just because I've never asked, but I don't know anybody that has leveraged Yelp as like a consultant or a coach. I as easily get. Makes so much sense. Yep. I easily get like 75% of business. What? Local business, I should say. Local business. Wow. Through Yelp. And I assume you don't have to be local to work with these people. No, I actually, I, I always say I get local business through Yelp because I work with a wide range of clients and I'm sure you do too, but my more local clients are definitely a little bit older mm -hmm. and they're people that are searching for someone to help them locally, even though I do everything virtually. Gotcha. Whereas a they lot of the younger client base, in person. yeah, exactly. Whereas a lot of the younger client base will find me because I write for Create and Cultivate and Recruiter.com and I'm on Career Contessa. And so other people, younger clients will find me that way and say, oh, it doesn't matter where you're located. I found you here. You're an expert. I can, you can help me. And so that's kind of how I got, sorry for that long roundabout oh, answer, that's, but that's so helpful. I think for people who are on the entrepreneur side or on, you know, the freelance side is 
I'm always curious how you got that first client and then how you built the business from there because it's one thing to start a company and to have an idea that you're pretty sure people will pay for. It's quite another to get them to pay for it and to even Absolutely. get them to be aware that you exist. Yeah. And I have to imagine there's got to be stiff competition out there for things like this, primarily from companies that are just using an algorithm. Exactly. You have to compete with, but I imagine that what you offer is you have that one-on-one, -on -one, you know. Exactly. Work. That is the number one piece of feedback that I get is that people want to work with me because they say, I can tell you're a real person. Which yeah. is kind of funny when you're they say that to you directly and you're talking on the phone and you're like, yes, I am a real person. We're that would be a phone an amazing AI. If it yeah, was exactly. Like a real time phone conversation. We're not there yet, people. The robots haven't quite taken over. Just exactly. Yet. But yeah, that's a huge part is people often, they'll search for it and they'll come across something that's, I had someone once tell me, well, I can get a resume done for $20 online. Go for it. Yeah. And that's exactly what I said. I said, try it out. Let me know how that works for you. I would love to know if that works out. Like by all means, power to you if you can get a great deal like that. But I promise you, you are not going to work with a person. Yeah. Okay. So you start your business, you end up building up enough clientele that you can quit the day job. So this is about what, a year and a half, two years ago now? Yeah. June of 2016. So we are about a year and a half later. Wow. That's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. It's been really, really fun and really exciting. And I can't believe how fast time has flown. Uh, yeah. When you have your own business, I feel like one week is about a month in normal time. Yep. Just so much happens so quickly. Yeah. And so before we move on to all the resume help, which I want all of it, um, <laughs> I want to know from a pers your perspective as somebody that is currently loving their job, which yes, you created for yourself, but I'm always curious, like, what do you think it is right now about what you do that really makes you feel fulfilled in your career? Absolutely, that I get to make a difference in people's lives and that I get to help people feel confident because I am always amazed at how people don't see their value and how little people think of themselves. It's just sad. because, yeah, it is. And I often get people that, I'll do their resume and they'll write back to me and they'll say, I don't know if I have that qualification. And I sit there and I go, look, you look at all that you've accomplished. You absolutely can say that you are an expert in your field or you are an executive level, whatever it is. And helping people realize all that they have to offer and being able to also see such a wide range of career paths is definitely my favorite Yeah, that's part. gotta be a lot of fun to be able to help tell the story of all these different types of people. Absolutely. Especially I get, I've even had um, a mortuary makeup artist. I've had, wow. yeah, I mean, I get some pretty out of the box career paths and it's actually, it's really fun to see all the different options and how people choose to live their life and go about their career. What, would you say that you're starting to notice any trends in particular? What I mean by that is um, I have to imagine, my assumption is that you know, we keep hearing more and more that people are staying at jobs for shorter and shorter periods of time. Mm -hmm. I think people are becoming, especially millennials, more confident in switching industries and roles after a few years, like they don't feel pigeonholed anymore. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing any sort of commonalities across, you know, different age ranges or just in general with your clients? Oh, absolutely. I mean, for sure, the older client base stays at jobs longer. Uh, but again, it also depends on the company and the benefits and the growth because yes yeah because i have a lot of friends and clients that find a company that offers great benefits but also a lot of growth and that they don't pigeonhole their um, employees so in that sense if you're at a great company that you love and you don't feel pigeonholed and you have all the benefits that you need then people will stay there for a long time and they will absolutely switch roles and change and develop as they get older and as their career changes but is again, it comes down to, do you have those options? And if they, those options aren't available, that's when people change jobs. That's like the number one thing I hear from my workshop attendees is, you know, people are often sad when they're coming to that point where they're like, I think I have to look for a new job. Like mm -hmm. most people don't hate their jobs. Most people yeah. that end up in my workshops are like, I mean, I feel like I've done everything I can do here and there's nowhere else for me to go. And I would love to stay because I love my coworkers or, you know, it's yep. comfortable, but in order to keep growing, I need to move on. And so Absolutely. 
that's a big thing that I work with companies on is being able to leverage your employees, different types of skill sets and different interests and keep them under the same umbrella and like let them experiment with their careers internally. So you're not having to hire new people all the time. They're not having to go through the horrible process of looking for a new job. And all of those things I feel like could be circumvented if employers and employees were more honest with each other about Absolutely. what they needed to get out of one another. But Absolutely. I think we're still in a, we're very much in an evolution of the workplace. Um, I mean, even since I've been working, which is like 11, 12 years now, things are so different than they were when I first graduated undergrad. So yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, it's interesting though, because the one thing I will say on that is I think a lot of the times people equate growth into management. And I think that I know those two, (laughs) I know, but I think that those, those two terms are not interchangeable at all. And so often people think, well, if I'm going to get a better job, that must mean that I need to go into management when really it's, you know, if you're in sales and you want to get a better job, you want to get a nest. Well, not necessarily, but you could very well get a better sales job, but not yeah. be in management. Make and more I think money. that exactly. Yeah. I think that's where people really struggle and companies struggle too, because they hire people just from one role into the next where it's, they're not going to thrive. The employee isn't going to thrive. The saddest thing I can see is in companies when somebody works their way up, they're an incredible, we'll say great graphic designer and Mm -hmm. they've been doing incredible work. They've got great client skills, all of the above. And then they get promoted to manager of their department. And suddenly they're not doing the thing that they're great at anymore. They're exactly thrust into this role that they have no qualifications for. Exactly. I I really wish come one of my greatest dreams for the working world is if companies would stop hiring people to start at the bottom and move up and rather like with managers hire that as a specific role. That is a particular job. Like, yes, I feel so strongly about this. Good at management. Like most people are not meant to lead others and it certainly should not be a reward for being great at something and then being put in a role that you have no business being in. Especially I wholeheartedly agree. If they don't provide the training to like help yes. you become a manager. Like it's one thing if you're like, okay, I'm ready to take on a managerial role. I'm ready to move in that direction and then have the company just leave you hanging. I think it's quite another if they're like, okay, let's get you on a management track. We're going to train you, yep. give you the tools you weren't taught in school because you didn't go to school to be a manager. Who goes to school to be a manager? I mean, I think that's what an MBA is for, but I have one and I never had any intentions of using it to be a manager. exactly. Management, I mean, I think that's definitely the purpose of an MBA because they make you do so many damn group projects. And (sighs) inevitably, I was the one corralling all the monkeys in my group and I hated every second of it. Well, that's why you're doing what you're doing. No, my own thing, yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I like working around people, but not necessarily in charge of people. Yep. But I know that about myself and I think that's an important piece. Yeah, well, that's another thing is, you know, knowing, just like you mentioned, really knowing your skills and knowing what you want. Yeah. And if you don't give yourself the space to identify what you want, you're going to keep going after the same kind of things. It's like relationships. If you don't identify what keeps going wrong in relationships, you're going to keep dating the same damn person. Yep. I think I see it the same with careers. It's like people keep thinking it's their boss. That's the problem or it's the whatever. And usually it has something to do more with themselves than that external thing. And so until they face that fact and they do something about it, they'll just keep repeating the process. And the harm in that is if you keep repeating the same process and having the same result and not getting what you ultimately want, you're going to get less and less ballsy to, to try something different. Yes. You know, you're going to, that's when you're like, well, I guess it's just the way that the world is, or I guess that's just how things are. Yeah. In reality, you might've been able to fix something that you had no idea what the actual problem. Yeah. No, it's it's so true. Do you have any like tools or exercises that you do with people to help them identify, you know, what they actually want out of work? Is that something you do with them? Yeah. I mean, I do a lot of the content writing. I do career coaching and I teach workshops as well, but a lot of what I do is content. And one of the things that I always tell people when they're looking for a job is don't search by a job title. I think people really tend to put themselves in boxes of a specific job title of, oh, I need to be an HR manager or I need to be a, exactly. So what I tell people to do is make a list of the skills 
not only that you're good at, but that you really enjoy doing or you would love to develop more. Mm -hmm. And then search the skills and see what jobs come up. So where do you do that? Because I've been waiting for this beautiful tool to come along or for LinkedIn to provide it where you could put in everything you're great at. And like you said, all the things that you're decent at, but would like to improve upon. And then maybe even the things you know nothing about, but you'd like to eventually work towards and have it spit out all the various job titles that you are appropriate for. And I don't know how to do that. Well, we should create an app to do that. Oh, you God, and me, we could do it. Yep. All right. Um, <laughs> let's put that on our list. Make it happen. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I tell people just job boards and job search engines. Uh, I use Indeed a lot. I really love Indeed. So that's still a valuable source. Yeah, absolutely. And LinkedIn. And I think, you know, it is a bit of a process and it does take time. It's a little bit of a pain. Not going to lie. Because you have to search you know, whatever it is, customer service or it's very manual stuff. It is absolutely very manual. And I wish it wasn't, but I think that searching for skills, you know, if you do put that skill in or Photoshop or a program, whatever it is, you'll get job titles that have that in the job description. And it's like and breadcrumbs, right? It'll like, exactly. And it, it's a process, but I find that actually not having that actual app or whatever to tell you exactly what you should be doing gives people the tools to really search and browse and look at things that they wouldn't expect again without the job title that box mm. that they're supposed to that's be that's a in. good point well and i suppose you know your job is a very 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 important part of your life so the idea that it should be simple to find a good one for you i guess is ridiculous <laughs> yeah exactly i mean in one sense, we all didn't, I think we did it in high school, that job, whatever, you take the test and it tells you what you would be good at. Oh, yeah. I'm sure everyone's done that. And so you think about it and whoever does that stuff, you know? Yeah. So I, I feel like that might be the same thing. But again, I think searching for the skills and kind of forcing yourself to really explore different opportunities is a really good way to kind of figure out where you want to go and at least Every give you start. a better intuition. Yeah. Of maybe side projects you could take on or different volunteer opportunities or whatever that is or whatever that looks like for you. True. And you know, I always tell people too, like if you, if you know the kind of industry you want to get in, like if that's the most important thing to you, cool. Start searching those companies, like companies in that industry and just see what they're hiring for and yep. then see what's your closest, you know, best aligned to for open roles. If the job itself is the most important thing, start there and then be open to different industries. If it's like a culture fit that is most important, then you go to Glassdoor and you use reviews yep. of companies. But it's hard when you're starting at zero and you're like, I could do anything in any company. I don't care what the benefits are. It's like, you've just opened yourself up to every potential job in the world, which yeah. at first glance seems good because your options are limited, limitless. Yeah. But we're humans and we don't like choice. Turns out yeah. too many choices is paralyzing. It's paralysis by analysis. And that's the worst. Thing I love that. It's true though. You're like, uh, I don't know where to start. So I'm going to do nothing. I am totally going to use that. that Steal is away. So true. I didn't make it up, but it's <laughs> so helpful to think about like why so many people stay in crappy jobs. And it's because the options are too varied. Like there's yeah. too many options, so they don't know where to begin. So I love, I love the thought of like doing a little bit of exploration of like, okay, I'm just going to put in the skills I have and see where I land. Oh, I didn't know that was a job that I could do based on my experience. I think that's really fun. Yeah. And I think one of the other things, it, sorry to interrupt. One of the other things is that, you know, you can take on little side projects. So, you know, if you are in a company that will let you do a little bit of exploration. I think it's totally fine and it actually will really benefit you to talk to your manager and say, hey, I'd love to explore this other sector of it. Can I be part of this project, even just as a minor role to kind of get a little bit more experience and then slowly you are adding that experience to your resume. You are being able to transition without actually thinking about it and saying, oh my gosh, I need to get a new job. But you're just taking little snippets and trying new skills to add. Mm -hmm. So it's not that hard. It's not this big, massive, oh my gosh, I need to transition. Right. I, yeah, I love that. I call that like having an internal side gig because everybody mm -hmm. these days has a side gig, right? Yeah. Even if you're not meaning to take it full time, everybody's got a second thing. I mean, especially in LA, you say, hi, what do you do? And people are like, I do this and I also do this and I also run this blog and I, and it's like, yep. Okay. Um, yeah. but I think there's something to be said for 
allowing your entrepreneurial tendencies or your curiosities to take place at your day job. Yes. I mean, if anything, it makes you look like an even better employee because you're going above and beyond your title and your typical job roles. And it shows your manager that like, oh, this person's like down to grow with the company and contribute yep. in a new way. From yep. And then it, perspective, it's great because you get a little bit of extra out of everybody. Exactly. And then it also allows you, like I said, when you do go, if you are looking to get a more permanent job or a job more focused on that other sector of work, it allows you to kind of manipulate your job duties and integrate all of those keywords and buzzwords and say, Hey, I actually worked on this project. Even though my role was this, I have experience in this sector too. So you can take me on and I'll fly or thrive right. or whatever you well, want to Well, that's a perfect it. segue to, you know, if you're at the point where you're coming to a resume writer, professional resume writer, and you're like, well, I've been doing accounting my whole career, but I would love to get into, you know, something slightly different. I'd love to get into sales. Um, do people generally come to you when they are at the moment where they're like, I need a new job now? Or do you ever have people that come to you when they're like, I haven't updated my resume in forever and I'm starting to think about moving on? Like at what points, I imagine definitely when people are looking for a job, they come to you, but do you ever have the people that are preemptively getting their resume ready? Yes, and I love it. That's gotta be <laughs> I would so much prefer that. Yeah. Yes, no, I mean, to, I, I love working with all of my clients, but definitely the people that are just getting stuff ready and thinking about it are generally more prepared than the people that are scrambling. And I talk about this a lot, but with your resume, it's really important to kind of update it as you go and at least take notes or throw everything in a Google Drive or whatever it is that you want to do on new projects that you're working on or how many people that you're working on or your sales metrics. Because what happens is often the jobs that you've been dreaming about forever come up and you need to apply yesterday. Yeah. And then you're scrambling and you probably won't have the most effective document when you have to get it done in five minutes yeah. than when you are just thinking about it and you're like, Hey, you know what, within the next six months or whatever it is, I need to make a change. So I'm going to start putting all of those factors into place. And so I definitely have people on both ends of the spectrum. And I much prefer to work with the people that are trying to figure it out than the people that are really, really just not in a good position, to be honest, yeah. and that need yeah. to get it done as quickly as possible because they usually can't provide all of the best information. And in, right, at the end experience. of the day, it's not going to serve them that well. Yeah, right. I can get something done for you fairly quickly, but, and I tell them this, is it going to be your most effective document? Probably not. And yeah. as long as you understand that, I can work with you, but I'm not going to sit there and say, this is going to be your best thing ever. Right. You know, because it's, it takes time to gather all that information. Yeah. I always say looking for a job when you aren't in need of a new job or preparing your resume, getting your LinkedIn updated, whatever it is long before it's ready or long before you need it is like grocery shopping on a full stomach versus an empty stomach. Yep. Cause like if you go grocery shopping hungry, you're going to make very bad decisions. You're going to buy the Cheetos. You're going to just be like in that, you know, need state of mind where like, I'm just hungry. I don't care. I'll take whatever. Whereas if you go on a full stomach, you're making good, healthy decisions and you can take your time and you're not crazy and hangry like we all yeah. are. I think the same goes for your career. So if you're listening and you're like, yeah, I'm not quite ready to move on yet, but maybe it's been a good while since you updated, maybe since the last time you got a job, which I think is whenever most people update their yep. resume is when they need it. Yep. Um, do you focus on LinkedIn at all? I do. I feel so strongly that everyone should optimize their LinkedIn profile. And you what know, does that I, mean? What does that mean? <laughs> well, first of all, please, by every means, have a professional picture. Now, I always tell people it doesn't mean that you have to pay for headshots, but I am always amazed at the selfies and the pictures in front of a Christmas tree or what? at a club. What? I have seen the worst LinkedIn profile pictures ever. So I always tell people, please, oh at the very least, put on a blazer or a shirt, whatever you're going to wear, and have someone take a picture of you in front of a blank wall. I mean, something that is presentable. I do think it's worth investing in a photographer and have headshots that you can use for a while in a variety of different um, 
you know, on your LinkedIn, on a website, whatever that is, but definitely have a profile photo because I believe it's up to 36 times more profile views with a profile photo on LinkedIn. Oh yeah. I just assume they're not a real person if they don't have a photo. Absolutely. Absolutely. But also making sure that your LinkedIn aligns with your resume. But the way I always describe it is LinkedIn is a professional platform, but it's more personal. Mm. You know, you, okay. I was always curious of the difference. If your resume should be exactly as it is on LinkedIn and vice versa, or if there are differences. Okay. So that's, what do you mean by it's more personal? Well, so I always say the job descriptions are pretty much going to be the same because the job description is a job description, but with LinkedIn, you can attach media. So if you have a presentation that you can attach, that's awesome. But the biggest thing is the summary. So what I always tell people is you want to talk directly to whether it's your clients or your potential employers, whoever it is that you are trying to connect with on LinkedIn and make an impact, you want to talk directly to them. Hmm. So I always suggest that people have a summary in first person and share bits and pieces of yourself to make you seem more like a real person. So you don't want to get too personal, but for example, I mean, I talked to you about this at the beginning. I'm sixth generation born and raised in San Francisco. That is a huge part of my identity. And that's also something that I share on LinkedIn because it's a good talking point. Someone can say, oh, I've been to San Francisco or I've always wanted to go there, but it gives someone, it makes them feel like they know you a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. A touch point better than your resume. That's just very clean cut. You're not going to say, Hey, I love, I love yoga or on my side hobby or when I'm not working, Mm -hmm. I, which I don't do, but I don't teach yoga, but (laughs) you know what I mean? Whatever it is, um, it gives you an opportunity to share a little bit more about who you are. And from an employer standpoint, they can kind of see if you'll be a fit into the company culture. Right. With the other employees, Mm -hmm. which is such a huge piece. That's it. That's a big piece that I think is a mystery when job searching. Um, You know, you can tell what the, you can get a good idea of like, what the job title is going to be like, what the day-to-day is going to be like, but that culture fit is the hardest part. So that's, yeah. that's a good preemptive way to kind of put yourself out there and yep. let companies self-select and be like, she wouldn't fit in or she would. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, from a soul, again, going back to the photo, but just the whole profile, when someone looks at your LinkedIn profile, you become a person instead of a name on a piece of paper. And so it establishes an emotional connection, whether it's conscious or subconscious, it establishes a connection. And so whoever, again, if it's a client or potential employer, whoever it is you're trying to connect with, they're more likely to remember you than just a name coming across their email or through a resume or whatever it is. And this goes back to something I say all the time, which is just be a person. Like we're all just people. And I know the job search process feels Sometimes very inhumane and cold and yep. one sided and awful, really. Um, but at the end of the day, the person looking at your resume is somebody's person, right? They're somebody's yeah. best friend or somebody's neighbor. You might have something in common with them. I think being able to establish, even if it's one sided and they're seeing it on your profile, like, oh, San Francisco, I'm from there too. Or I think yeah. I, I just recently changed my description or my. Um, whatever, what's it called? That first paragraph, the summary, the summary, and it still needs work. Maybe I'll hire you. Um, <laughs> but I used to have on there, like Bailey Hancock is many things, but tall is not one of them. And you know, <laughs> you and me both, right. Five footer over here. Me um, too. No way. Yep. Girls. Yep. <laughs> um, but I put like, I'm, I hail from Florida and da, 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 da. And usually people are like, Oh no way. My grandparents. Live in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> so it's something, it's something Absolutely. for people to lock in their brain. is like, Oh, I, you know, maybe they know, maybe they go to the same Publix in Florida. You never know. Even yeah. if you think that intentionally. Totally. It's so funny because I actually had someone email me the other day for a resume. And at the end she wrote, yes. Hi, I'm from the Bay area too. <laughs> Right. It was just something. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, Hey, that's awesome. You know, but it, it enables that conversation and it makes things a little bit less formal and a little bit more personable, which anything that can help in that situation in the hiring process is greatly needed and appreciated. Yeah. So I want to kind of, I want to talk through like resume and LinkedIn profiles side by side. Like let's go through the top. So we talked about the summary on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Do people, do you still put an objective at the top of a resume? Is that a thing? Anymore? I don't call it an objective. 
don't, so you don't, don't need to write the term word objective. <laughs> nope. And the way they explained it to me actually when I got certified, and this is how I explain it to my clients. Same thing, by the way, goes with references available upon request. No shit. If someone asks you, you for reference, <laughs> yeah, if someone asks you for references, you're going to give them to them or you're not going to get the job. Right. So I always found that one to be quite redundant. I was like, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Your resume, and we can go into this, you know, the length and all of that. But regardless of if your resume is one pages or two, that space is precious. And so there is no need to add extra terms like objective or references available upon request when you know what it is. So mm -hmm. I actually that do space. have for more yeah. important things. Yeah. I call it a headlining statement. Okay. So that's what I call it internally. And I don't have that written on there, but just kind of an overview, an overview or a snapshot of your career. And so I always say you want to kind of have who you are. So say you're a social media expert, what you do, who cultivates relationships and what you're excited about or what you could bring to a company. So I kind of break it up into those three sections. But again, it's just a quick snapshot that if someone does look at your resume, again, an average of six seconds. They can read that, get a little bit of an idea of who you are and what they can expect from the document. And then they can move on to pick out the important factors. So it sounds like it's probably the same length as like your Instagram bio or your Twitter bio, yep. but professional focused. That's a great way to put it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you have to be succinct with those. You have only so many characters and it's like, okay, who am I in a very quick little snippet? You yes. know, Got to be, but I have to say words. professional focus is the key word because yes. I have seen resumes <laughs> that it was for an analyst position and someone wrote yoga and wine lover. And I was just oh, golly. smacking my head <laughs> going, Oh no, please don't send that out. Please don't keep it on your Instagram or Tinder or whatever oh. you're going to do, but not on your resume. Oh gosh. Are there any, um, are there any major like no nos that you have or words that you refuse to use? Like I heard you say cultivate and it's funny in my resume, there are so many words that, you know, I cultivate the one that came to mind where it's like cultivate relationships and da -da 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 -da. are there any words that you're like, do not use this word. Synergy is out. Authentic yep. is out. Like, do you have any of those buzzwords? Synergy and authentic, I think are just overused, but yes. To be honest, in a resume, I don't use the word I. Ah. In a cover letter, that's awesome. But in a resume, I don't like to put it in first person. I like to put it the way that I do resumes. And I think I'm slightly more traditional in that in this sense. But I like to have it pretty metric and achievement heavy. So what I always say is I want you to articulate exactly what you've done and what you can bring to a new company. Because anyone can say, I'm great at my job. Well, sure. But, what does that mean? Exactly. But very few people can actually show why they're great at their job. So, so you like want you to would show say, people, you know, increase profits by 20%. Exactly. Or instead of one of the big things, and I actually write about this in a lot of my articles, but the head, or maybe it's the previous head of career builder said, instead of saying results driven, show me your results. Hmm. So, I like that. Yeah. So Prove I don't it. like to say results driven you know, executive, sales executive, I want to say sales executive with a proven track record of increasing year over year by 20% or whatever it is. So show me exactly what you've accomplished. Because my goal when creating a resume, and this should be everyone's goal, but it's, it doesn't always turn out that way. But my goal is creating a document that is unique to each person. So mm -hmm. someone else shouldn't be able, to be able to slap their name on your resume and use it for themselves. Even if they've had the exact same career path, you don't exactly. want someone else to be able to use your resume. You want it to really be unique to you and exactly what you've done at each job. So this is something I've always struggled with. Um, I think in my younger days, and I think a lot of us do this early on, is you get into the habit of listing the job responsibilities under each role as opposed to what you did above and beyond. What are your feelings? Exactly. I think you should list above and beyond. So if you have the space, you can totally talk about what you did at your job. But the biggest thing is those achievements and those accomplishments and when you went above and beyond. Because everyone knows what an administrative assistant does. Mm -hmm. Filing, copying, all that great stuff. But it's when you went above and beyond your role and you organized an event for 50 company executives and you 
secured the location and did the catering and did the fundraising or whatever it is, that's what people don't expect. Right. So if someone can expect, okay, I am looking for a sales executive that can, you know, maintain a pipeline of clients or that can handle in and outbound calls, whatever it is, that's great. You can add that in there if you have the space, but you want to include the information that someone can't predict that you've done. Oh, that's a good way to think about it. So like if they read the job description, what couldn't they gather just by looking exactly. at Exactly. What if you, this has happened to me and I think with the startup world emerging more and more, what if you have a job title that doesn't translate to other industries? So for example, when I was at General Assembly, my first role was um, campus marketing producer. And a lot of us were called producers. And obviously in every other industry, that means something totally different. Yeah. Um, would you, do you ever suggest like changing the actual job title to something that's relevant to the job, like something comparable to the industry you're getting into? Or do you just maybe include a qualifier in like the cover letter or a bullet point under that job? It depends on how specific your company is. And so, yes, I, I think it's totally okay to kind of tweak the job title as long as it, again, relates back to what you do. Because at the end of the day, now there are all sorts of HR protocols that they can't ask. A lot of companies can't actually ask for a recommendation from HR professionals because mm. what was happening is people were giving, or HR was giving people good reviews to get them out of the company. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So there are a lot of qualifiers. So again, it depends on how specific your company is and how comfortable you are because Ultimately, you have to make sure that you're comfortable with your resume. Mm. So if you are not comfortable tweaking that job title, so then I feel like say, maybe you're being dishonest. Exactly. So then it. I would say leave it and then put a bullet point. So producer served at, what did you do there? What, um, what, campus marketing. So campus it was marketing. Really like audience development and growth. Okay. So then putting a bullet point saying, you know, sir, did audience development, whatever, as a producer. You know, put a qualifying bullet. Oh, okay. That's what that means. Exactly. But ultimately you want to make sure that you are really confident in what you're putting forward. And so if you're iffy about changing it, then I would say, don't, don't rock the boat. Do a gut check. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Okay. Sorry. I I went off on a tangent there. So (laughs) let's go back to the top. So we've got our little objective that we're not calling objective anymore. And we're not, we love yoga and wine. Um, Do you, so what about the page number? Because that's a big one, I think. How many pages? Yeah. Are you allowed to have more than one? And if so, what are the parameters? So are you allowed to have more than one? Yes, if you need it. And so, so what would constitute needing it? Exactly. It's, it's really hard. I, this is by far the number one question I get asked. One page or two pages. Don't go over two pages unless you're doing an academic CV, in which case that's a whole nother beast. Yeah, those are like 10 And pages those are very... Off. Exactly. Those are very particular, but give or take, if you have 10 years or less in the workforce, you probably don't need to go over a page. Now, again, it depends on your industry because I have a lot of say uh, corporate security professionals or engineering professionals that have a lot of certifications Mm. and those need to be listed. And so that that probably takes up a ton of space. Exactly. So it kind of depends, but I always say you either want one page or close to two. You don't want, if it's less than a third onto the second page, you can figure out how to make it fit. You can cut stuff out, but give or take, I say, within the last 10 years, like if you only have about 10 years of employment, you probably don't need over a page. Do you put every job you've ever had on there or only the relevant ones to the job you're applying for? It's so hard with resumes because it really, it depends on the person. But I say, if you've been in the workforce longer than 10 years, you probably don't have to go earlier than 10 to 15 years ago. Like, If you've been working prior to 2000, you probably don't need the 90s on your resume. Mm. Um, But as far as relevant work history, I think you don't need to include every job if you have a pretty consistent career path. Now, you don't want to just put relevant jobs and then you have three or four years in between of employment gaps because automatically Mm. someone's going to look at your document and say, 
well, what did you do in those years between? Mm -hmm. But what you can do is you can break it up into related experience and unrelated experience. Ah, so it doesn't have to be timeline based. It doesn't always have to be timeline based. A really good way that I get around it is I always put what I call a summary of qualifications up at the top under the headline and statement. And that's definitely a um, signature of my documents. So what I do is I think the skills absolutely need to be up at the top because if someone is only going to spend six seconds and they want to look at that headline statement, see that you have the skills and then look at those achievements that usually will pretty much stand out on the page, hmm. numbers and big brands and stuff like that. But the summary of qualifications is a really kind of good way to get around if you don't have experience that, well, okay, let me back up. If you had started your career in one industry, then kind of transitioned into something else, but maybe want to go back into where you started, mm. putting the skills from maybe the beginning of your career, but putting those skills that you still have up in that summary of qualifications is a really good way to kind of camouflage that maybe mm. you haven't been doing it for the last few years, right. but you still have those skills. Interesting. That's a great approach because yeah, I mean, if somebody's taking less than 30 seconds to take a look, you obviously are like feeding them the information you want them to know right off the bat. Yeah. And I think it's, that's something really powerful that people don't necessarily think about is that you have the opportunity to show people exactly what you want them to see. Hmm. And that, that kind of sounds bad in a way. No, but it's but marketing. It's self-marketing. Exactly. You have the power to show people what you want them to see. So if you want them to see an accomplished passionate, whatever your title is, that's what you can show them. If you want them to see your weak points, which no one does, <laughs> but you, you can show that too. It's just about marketing yourself correctly and showing people exactly what you want them to see. Interesting. Okay. And so do you, this just came to my mind. I haven't actually done a resume in a while because I've worked for myself for a while and the last couple jobs have been referral based, but I don't think I've really done a resume since LinkedIn has been as pervasive. So do you ever put on there like complete resume available on my LinkedIn profile or anything like that? And do you recommend putting literally everything you've ever done on your LinkedIn or is it the same rule? It's the same rule. I think LinkedIn, you can get away with putting more because there's no, it's a space limit situation. and they well, and they can look at what they want to look at True. because LinkedIn, they're probably not spending just a few seconds. They've probably gone to LinkedIn because they want to learn more about you. Right. They're in the stalking mode. Exactly. <laughs> and so one of the things that I always tell people is you don't have to put your LinkedIn profile information on your resume because if you are doing LinkedIn correctly, someone should be able to search your name and your company or your industry, whatever, and mm -hmm. find you. If, if they can't do that, then you're probably not using LinkedIn to its fullest potential. But yeah, I think that you can have more on your resume. But again, you want to make sure that people are getting the right image. Yeah. So if you're trying to change or transition careers, then I would put more of whatever you're trying to transition into mm -hmm. and create a stronger focus. Because I think that's where that's the biggest mistake people make is I get a lot of people that say, oh, well, I'm a jack of all trades or I'm a Jill of all trades and I can do anything. And that's great. But ultimately, if your document isn't focused on what kind of job you want to get, it's not going to be effective. This is something that also comes up over and over and something I harp on is it's not that you have to hide parts of yourself. It's that people are lazy when it comes to remembering you. Mm -hmm. And so if you aren't clear on who you want to present to them, if you don't give them a clear indication of like, I want you to think of me as a social media marketing executive. And instead you're like, I do social media. I also do events. I also do this. Mm -hmm. Then you go in the miscellaneous bin in people's minds and Absolutely. they categorize you or they think that you're flaky, which isn't fair because I think the rise of multi-passionates, which I definitely consider myself, mm -hmm. is, is getting to be more and more of a thing. And so people, people are able to learn things quickly and they are able to start up side gigs so much easier than they used to. But that doesn't mean you have to present all of yourself right off the bat. Absolutely. Like, be clear on who you're trying to be seen as. Otherwise, you're going to come across as muddled and just, you know, gray as opposed to a specific color. Definitely. And, you know, one of the things that I always say is 
regardless of how talented you are, ultimately, if you don't align with the position you're interested in, if someone cannot look at your document and see the qualifications and see how you directly align with the position you applied to, you're probably not going to get the position because no one wants to spend the time from a potential employer perspective. And I started in recruiting. When you're getting hundreds of resumes, to be honest, I would keyword search for the qualifications that I needed. And if they had those qualifications, if they came up highlighted on the resume, I would put them in the pile of, okay, when I have a couple more minutes, I will look through these candidates to see who fits and who I can contact. And if not, they just get pushed aside. And that sounds really harsh, but there Stop are an the average name. of 250 applicants, probably more now per corporate job opening. Wow. And when you think that a real person is on the other end of that, whether or not they are using an applicant tracking system to sort through the resumes, some point or another, there is one person or a couple people sitting on the end going, oh my gosh, I have to look through all of these. Right. So how do you stand out? You just mentioned keywords. So yep. what's the process? You go to the job posting and you pull out the qualifications they're looking for and make sure you weave them into your resume. I always do that. And I think it's, if you are not using your job applications or the applications that you are applying to, when you're writing your resume, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. So every resume should kind of be unique to the job that you're applying for. Yeah. And I think people get really scared by that because ultimately, if you are applying to social media jobs, you're not going to have to tweak it that much. Right. You know what I mean? Your resume should work for a variety of social media jobs. But the example that I use a lot is leadership versus management. So if you look at a job description and they happen to use the word leadership throughout that job description, we're looking for a leader to lead teams, but you have used the word we're manager and I manage teams throughout your resume. When they search for leadership, you might have all of those qualifications, oh, but you so might not come up on the search. That point. Exactly. But what happens is when so many applications are coming through and you just have a few minutes or a few seconds really to search that it's those little details. Gosh. All right. And it sounds well. scary, but it's, it's really <laughs> not as people get so overwhelmed and I yeah. get it, but it's really not as difficult as it sounds. And, you know, another huge mistake that I think people make is I sometimes get people that will write me and say, I've applied to 30, 40 jobs in the past month and I haven't heard anything. And I think it makes you will be a lot more successful if you send out three really great, amazing, mm -hmm catered job or job applications and work really hard to make those stand out then send out 40 that just you're just sending out your resume and cover then letter to just spraying send out. and praying <laughs> mm -hmm. oh yeah lauren uses that term yeah a lot of people do it's funny where they're like just screw it i'm just gonna send my resume out yep and you know i've also had conversations with uh career coaches who have said you know, by doing that, it makes you feel like you're doing a good job looking for a new job, but really it's just procrastination. You're just oh, yeah. waiting, doing the hard work for a few of them, as opposed to just feeling like, well, I don't know what's going on. I applied to a hundred different places. Nobody's calling me. It's like, and I think people like to say I've applied to so many jobs. Yeah, it makes them feel like they're doing something. Exactly. When at the end of the day, it's like, I know when I'm cheating myself out of a workout by half passing yeah. it you're doing the same thing by getting it. Nobody's getting their muscles or their new yep. job if you're half-assing it. So yep. full ass it, you guys. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But again, it, it sounds really, really intimidating. But if you just sit down and carve a few minutes, you guys can make really effective and really amazing documents with just a little bit of effort. Just reading, like actually reading the job description and not skimming it will make a world of a difference. Yeah, I always used to highlight like key pieces mm -hmm. and, you know, figure it like I would use different color highlighters for things that I was qualified for, things that I wasn't quite qualified for, things that I definitely wasn't qualified for. And when you do it color coded like that, you can get a pretty good idea of how far off you are from actually yep. being okay to apply for that job. Um, but yeah, the job search process sucks. So anything you can do from the get-go to make it less sucky, I think is very valuable. So we're going to link to all of your stuff in the show notes. I'm sure you have a ton of tools and templates and downloadables and articles, yeah. and all of that good stuff. And then of course your own services. So 
if you guys are feeling like, okay, yeah, I could do this on my own, but I don't want to, I got your girl. <laughs> I'm here for you. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. This was insanely helpful. I hope I don't have to write a resume again anytime soon, but if I do, I know who I'm calling. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks guys. Bye.